Welcome. How's your conference been going? Can you guys, is this too loud? Can you guys hear? <coughs> Welcome. <laughs> We're here to talk about Angular. How many of you guys are already using Angular, which is 2 plus, version 2 plus? Any Angular JS people? It's okay, you can raise your hand. All right, well, we're just gonna be talking about Angular 2 plus, the latest version, how many people are using Angular 5, latest? Anybody ready to use Angular 6? It's not here yet. PWA. <laughs> PWAs. That's right, uh, so, Sean, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah. my time, my day job as a web developer, I uh, touch Angular, and uh, the more we do this, so I, I, I realize that we can uh, bring the Esri mapping solutions into nearly any front-end framework. Let's do this. Let's do it. I'm Andy. I'm one of the technical product managers for the JavaScript API, and I've been working with Angular since AngularJS. Dive in. So there's, there's actually a long history with Angular and the JavaScript API. I think this is our third year presenting is, on this. Yeah. We've, we've gone through a, a number, of, number of iterations. Actually, let's get you, are you mic'd up? I think I okay. am. Is, uh, is this volume okay? Guys can hear Jacob. I think there's also some, uh, might be some space over on this side of the room, maybe in that corner, if you like, you're crowded at the door. Yeah, there's there. more room over to stage left. I don't know if you can get in there. Oh, can't see anything. Uh, there's a long history. We've gone through a number of iterations with Angular and the JavaScript API. So hopefully what we're showing you today is the latest 2018 version of how we're integrating with <laughs> Angular. And we're, we're also just gonna touch very slightly on some cool stuff that's coming. We're gonna mention some sessions that talk about the next generation of our integration with Webpack that's coming, but the majority of this session is going to focus on Angular. And yes, Angular, we're just focusing on Angular 5 plus. The patterns that we're talking about today, the, the repo that we're using is all about Angular latest. Uh, and we can certainly take questions about older versions of Angular, but we're really pushing forward with the latest. And we've also put our Angular JS stuff, for those of you that are using Angular JS, we have a number of repos out on github.com slash Esri that have gone into maintenance mode, primarily because just the speed at which Angular is, is being built out. You wanna say anything else about Angular? Yeah, so the, the link that's there uh, at the bottom of the screen is specifically for Angular, uh, specific, I guess they call it JS or version one or dot JS. Uh, so that's what we're not gonna be going into today. Uh, we, I guess we sort of see that as a more stable slash legacy solution for Esri and Angular 1. Um, so I, yeah, I'd, I'd bookmark and go to that repository, which has been around for a while. But the patterns that we established in there uh, became a big inspiration for how, this, how Esri JS API actually works and all other frameworks. So it sort of came from there, but it's a separate solution altogether. Very much, and if you wanna follow along the repo that we're using, is live on GitHub. This is where all the samples that we're doing and all the slides that we're showing you are on this GitHub repo. Let you guys take pictures. And, go ahead, sorry, if you do have your laptops today and if you wanna browse there, you can go ahead and clone or download that repo. Um, we'll, be sort of, we'll be sort of speeding through a few of the samples in there, but you're welcome to go ahead and grab it now if you want. Uh, just a shout out, using the frameworks with the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, Thursday, which is uh, March 8th, 2.30 p.m., Primrose A, 
Renee and Tom are going to do a amazing presentation and talk about more of the fundamentals for different frameworks, uh, Vue.js, if you're using Ember or anything other than Angular. That is a great fundamental session to go to. Also, Sean is going to be giving a Kickstarter, which is a more in-depth how to get going with Angular CLI, more of the Angular CLI fundamentals and how they relate to the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. That's Friday morning at 8.30. Yeah, big room, lots of seats, so please come. <laughs> <laughs> So the plan today, uh, we're assuming that you have some familiarity with Angular 2 Plus. If you don't, that's okay, just absorb. Slides are available on GitHub, you can go back and refer to it, you can ask us questions afterwards. Um, you wanna add yeah. um, to the comments here? Yeah, so everything will be available, so no worries if anything uh, goes by too quickly, um, or if you just are, or introduce to things you haven't seen before. That's not a problem. Uh, and we will be, I think the overall pattern will be learning how to use, or seeing at least brief demonstrations of how to use the Esri JS API inside of Angular apps. That's a recommended approach. So if you've already chosen Angular as your framework, then that's going to be your whole framework, right? But we're going to be sort of injecting and using Esri JS API in very specific places. And we'll show you how to do that. And we're specifically in this session talking about the CDN version of the JavaScript API. We aren't going to cover creating your own locally hosted version of the, of the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. This is all CDN based. So there's the sort of the shortened URL to the same uh, repo you just saw. Uh, so it's 13, uh, ezraurl.com slash 13900. That's faster to type in. Uh, so again, if you haven't already and if you want to, you're welcome to clone it, grab it, download it. And uh, we have a pattern in this repository um, where we have a, a subfolder called sample apps and we'll just sort of step through a few of those. All right, so I think I'll switch my screen. Yep, Sound good? I'm on one. I think we're, we're good there. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah, I think we're up. Cool. Um, okay, so I, what I'm going to do actually just for a moment is uh, go ahead and, and I'm going to open up my, my IDE that I use. In this case, it happens to be VS Code. And I've got right now in my terminal down here, I'm going to actually increase the uh, font there just a little bit. I'm just looking at my bottom panel there in my, my terminal window. I'm already sort of in my local copy of this repository, and I'm going to change directory uh, into the sample apps subdirectory, and then uh, within that, our first one is called app scaffolding. And now that I'm in there, uh, I'll actually flip back to the slides just to show you. Uh, if you're get, grabbing this for the first time, you will have wanted to do an npm install for the Angular command line interface. So that's the first one you see there. Uh, and as you're going through this repository, and if you want to play with our samples, for every single sample, you'll, you will do an NPM install as well, which will grab all the local dependencies, uh, Angular 5, uh, a utility that we call Esri Loader, and a few other things. And then to get going, uh, after you've typed in and, and run NPM install, you just need to run ng-serve. And ng is uh, the Angular uh, CLI command to start up a development, uh, a development server that can do like hot module, uh, I'm sorry, for, it'll, it'll do uh, automatic watching and, re and reloading as you make changes to your code. So I'll go ahead and run that. That'll just take a few seconds to get started and sort of, it'll sort of parse through all the source code that we have for our little sample app. And as I mentioned, it'll start a little development server. So in this case, it's localhost 4200. And if I open that up in uh, my local browser, what you see here is just the, as simple as you can get, nearly unaltered uh, beginner boilerplate Angular application. Uh, what we've done, the special fun part, is the, uh, the Esri mapping component that you see towards the bottom. So I can scroll down a little bit and you can see that this is actually a live, totally working Esri JS API uh, 4X uh, Matthew here. So um, I will actually uh, just navigate back to the uh, repo view here. It might be a little bit easier to look at some of these files. 
if I dive down in, in this view, again, this is just, a lot of this code is, was set up by the Angular CLI. We, we barely wrote any of this. If I dive into the source code of this particular sample application, again, all Angular boil, boilerplate right here. If I dive down further into app, still, for the most part, Angular boilerplate, and again, don't worry that I'm breezing through a lot of this. Well, we, we've created a simple Esri map component, and what we're doing is we're not, we're not really um, providing uh, this kind of special component that's hooked into the CLI or anything like that. It's just an example of writing a component that has mapping capabilities inside of it. And a few of the important files are the CSS, the HTML, and the TypeScript source file. CSS is really simple. This is actually where we bring in the Esri, uh, C, uh, the Esri style sheet from our CDN, and then we tell the Esri map view that we want it to be 500 pixels tall. The HTML is awesome. It's a div, and it just has a single div, and that's it, and a, and a uh, unique identifier, so we can look it up later and talk to it. Now the TypeScript for this Angular component uh, has a little bit more going on, but it's really not that complicated. Uh, really at the top here on line 14 is, again, standard Angular boilerplate to get a component up and running. The special thing here is Esri Loader, uh, which is actually another utility that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment that's available on GitHub from Esri, and that's a sort of framework agnostic utility for loading uh, the Esri JS API inside of other frameworks. So we just, uh, bring in the load modules method from the Esri loader utility, and further on down again in our Angular boilerplate, in our component code, uh, after the ng on init, we use the Esri loader to ask for uh, the map module and the map view module. So at this point, at this moment, where we're asking for these things, and we get those back, and those are loaded and brought in from the Esri JavaScript API, at that moment, we're actually just back into the uh, Esri world, so to speak. So Angular on the outside and right on the inside is a bit of Angular. Um, on the inside is the Esri world. That's just back to the JS API. And I will actually stop there, I think, and uh, hand it back to you, Andy, for the next part. Got it. And just a quick recap. This this slide is just. Summarizing, for those of you that are going to go back and look at the deck, this is just summarizing with everything that Jacob just covered. Um, so let's dig a little bit more into the app scaffolding and take this just a little bit further than what Jacob showed you. So again, here's the, the repo that you guys can access for those that, you, that came in late. And we're just in the sample apps directory. And I'm going to dive into sample two, which is more app scaffolding. And we're just going to dive into the source directory and start digging down the app. This is this everything that you've seen so far that I've clicked on in the samples directory was created automatically by the Angular CLI. We just did an ng create new component and automatically populated this. Um, and we also created a custom component called Esri Map. And what this sample does is starts to take it just a little bit further. And a couple of things to keep in mind when you're using this repo is, as Jacob mentioned, we've included Esri Loader in the package.json file. Normally, if it's not included in package.json, you can also, uh, you're going to talk about this a little bit more, but you can manually install it if you want. Jacob's going to go through all of that. And we're basically just using the boilerplate component. As Jacob mentioned, it is in inside of the on init event inside of an Angular component. And what I've done is I've taken Jacob's sample and I've extended it just a little bit further. Everything to this point should look like regular ArcGIS API for JavaScript, except you'll notice that there's a load modules method here. This is part of Esri Loader, and we're going to go into a little bit more in depth on that. And in the promise that's returned, all of this code should look like what you expect. A couple of minor differences, instead of the word var, we're using 
ES6 terminology. We're using let and const and and those types of things because when and and we're also using TypeScript and we'll talk about that a, a little bit more. When this compiles down in the Angular compiler, it actually becomes regular JavaScript. But we're using this terminology and we're using TypeScript for compile time checking and it's mainly a productivity enhancement. It has nothing to do with how the application runs. So a couple of other things that I've added on the Jacob sample is that I've extended some of these variables. So instead of just a monolithic component that runs by itself, what I've done is I've added some public properties for where the div is, and this is just Angular terminology for a div, the center of the map, the zoom property, and what I've done is I've used uh, some private variables to hold that information inside the component, but I've used the input decorator to expose things like zoom and center and the div where the map's going to be to make this a more modular component. Now I can use it in something else and inject the zoom, the center, etc., into the map. And so let's go back a directory. Let's go back one and go back a little bit further. In the parent, what we're talking about in Angular is the parent child relationship. So our component was standing alone in sample one. Now what we've done is we've exposed those properties and inside the parent component, I can actually set this information, like the center of the map, the base map type, and the zoom level. And I also had a, a map loaded event that I expose so that we can all of a sudden share that component across different components. And one of the questions we get asked about a lot is how do I maintain state? How do I share? different aspects of that component. And this right here is just focusing on how do we share different aspects of that component. So to give you an example, inside the HTML of that component, this is, this is what it looks like inside of an Angular 5 Plus application is we gave the name of this particular component, Esri Map, and this is the terminology that we use to bind those variables into it. So we've taken sample number one, extended it just a little bit further to show you how to bind those variables and make it just a little bit more extensible. So with that, oops. So with that, oops. We're gonna talk about Esri Loader. Okay, so yeah, we'll just take a little uh, Let's we'll step to the side for a moment and focus on the Esri loader. Um, it's really important, and I sort of see it as the glue that uh, sort of lets everything come together nicely. Um, so again, the overall approach here is to have an Angular application, your, as your entire framework, uh, but we need the Esri loader to help us get Esri inside of it in specific places where we need it. And it is on GitHub. Uh, it's one of our open source projects, Esri slash Esri loader. It's the repo there. Uh, installing it for your project, again, reg honestly, regardless of your framework, um, is really straightforward. It's just an NPM install, uh, since it's registered uh, up at N NPM. And as you, we've sort of touched on, it provides us with a method called load modules, which is more or less as a, as a wrapper around the Esri module loading you may be familiar with. Uh, so I, I sort of like to revisit the sort of uh, shortened, uh, condensed code snippet. Uh, if you imagine that we're looking at the source code for an Angular component, uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the new things here is an import, again, of load modules from the Esri loader library. And that's still Angular TypeScript code. But when you're ready to load modules, for example, uh, doing your components ng on init, that's when you sort of enter the Esri world again. And that's where you could go even to a sample page as, as simple or complex as you want to be and start porting that code over and making it work inside of your own component. So in this, in this little contrived example, I'm asking for the Esri slash map, map view, and a graphic. And then I get them, and then specific, specifically my, uh, my callback, 
that's where I'm in the uh, little Esri, Esri planet within the Angular galaxy. So as I sort of uh, keep rehashing, we're bringing Esri inside or within Angular, and as many of you know, the Esri JavaScript API uh, inherits from or is built sort of on top of Dojo. So you are you are bringing another smaller uh, another framework inside of Angular. So that's that's the reality of the situation, but you don't really need to worry about it. You don't really need to stress out about it. You can sort of put on your horse blinders and uh, not worry about the fact that Dojo is sitting inside of Angular. So again, you're going to import the load modules method from the Azure utility after you've npm installed it in your project. And what this is doing is behind the scenes, it's actually adding the Esri uh, uh, CDN script tag into your HTML, into your DOM after the fact. Now what's cool about this is that it's only doing it when you need it to, and it'll only do it once. So you can call load modules as many times as you want. You could have 20 mapping components that rely on this, but it'll only add a, a script tag once at that time. So what's nice is um, one plus is you don't have, this doesn't interrupt or mess with any of your Angular tooling, and you can also uh, potentially improve your initial app load performance. Let's say if you have a lot of different routes in your app, uh, it's cool because you only will grab those Esri resources and load them when you need them. So yeah, I encourage you to go to GitHub Esri slash Esri Loader, and it's got plenty of documentation and plenty of assistance there to get you going. So I'll take another uh, little slight detour and chat about TypeScript. Uh, the reason we're focusing so heavy on, heavily on TypeScript uh, for this purpose is because honestly it's used everywhere in Angular documentation and samples and tutorials. Uh, so I think the, the formal definition is a type superset of JavaScript that compiles to plain JavaScript. Uh, sort of a lot there, but I think it's, I sort of see it as a complicated way to say that uh, it's enabling types in JavaScript. So yeah, it introduces a slightly new syntax. Um, just a few new things, but it's really not that bad. And uh, it sort of provides you with a safety net. So instead of Typically in JavaScript, your types actually are just sort of, I see them as sort of stored in your brain. You're sort of keeping track if, as best as you can as a developer you know, if, you're, if you're dealing with numbers or strings or objects or whatever. Instead, you're, you can actually write that down and then TypeScript can enforce that as you move along throughout your code. Uh, so a little a simple example from the TypeScript's own documentation. Uh, if we have a variable called full name, we can assign it to the string called Bob Bobbington. Uh, that's fine. No problem. It might be a problem later if you forget that you meant it to be a string and you try to alter that somehow later. But with TypeScript, you can add an, a simple extra little syntax, the variable, colon, and then the type that you want it to be, in this case, string. And then it will enforce that later and give you warnings if you try to do funny things with it later that aren't intended for strings. And Esri provides type definitions for the ArcGIS API for JavaScript, and this means that um, actually, I'll go back a slide. Um, natively, you have things like strings and numbers and objects and arrays. Esri sort of adds on to that and provides unique types that are unique to the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. And there's a, a link here in the slide to go to that page to, to learn more about it. But it's also a simple npm install. Simple command there. And what you'll do in your Angular app, uh, that the Angular CLI will scaffold out and create for you, there's a, there is a TypeScript config JSON file and it's as simple as adding uh, the arcjs-js-api string to this property called types. What this does out of the box though is it gives you a global underscore underscore Esri. It's just a namespace that autom automatically starts appearing in your, in your code editor, your IDE, that'll help you sort of fill in these types and use them to your advantage. If you want to for readability sake, you can just rename it. It's a simple, simple statement there at the bottom. Uh, imports Esri equals underscore, underscore Esri. It's just a simple way to rename this so you don't have to see underscores all over your code if you don't want them there. It's up to you. <clears throat> so another uh, simple, uh, somewhat straightforward uh, contrived example is if you want to create a new Esri map, again, at this moment, at the top of the first code box, you are inside, you have used the Angular, I'm sorry, you have used the Esri loader inside of Angular to grab the Esri map module. So we're inside of the load modules method with the Esri loader. Uh, but now that we're in there, and I have access to this Esri map that I want to create, I can construct it without typing it. 
or assigning a type to, it's no problem, you can do that. If I want to though, it becomes a two-step process and it's a little bit more code, but it makes, I think it makes things a bit safer, especially if you want to alter this and, and mess with it in the, somewhere else or in the future. Uh, so I can, I can go as far as even typing the object that goes into the Azure Map constructor by, by saying that I have the variable called map properties, it's going to have the Esri map properties type, and I want it to have base map streets. And then when I create a new map that's going to be a new Esri map, I can also type it as uh, the syntax colon esri.map. So that'll prevent you from doing something silly like reassigning the variable map to the number 42 or something like that later. Uh, another example of where types I think are, uh, might help illustrate why they're, why they're helpful is if you have an array, you sort of have to keep in your own mind what that array is supposed to have inside of it. And if you want to create a graphic and add it to your array, you can do that. You can also start adding anything else to into your array, numbers, strings, objects, and that may not be what you intended. So you can also type all those things. So instead I can type my array of graphics variable as an array of esri.graphics, and that means that array can only have graphics inside of it. I can also construct a new graphic with a specific type called esri.graphic, and then when I'm pushing into that array, uh, TypeScript will enforce that. It will only allow instances of Esri graphics to go into that array. So it also saves you from weird bugs later on when you've pushed other things you didn't mean to push into that array. And the, I think the coolest part about it, even if you don't want to mess with typing uh, these things too much and thinking about it, my favorite thing is that you get, at least in my specific situation using VS Code, I can get immediate feedback when I start doing things incorrectly. So for this object that I'm going to send into my new map constructor, uh, if, I, if I name that object incorrectly, like base map with two P's at the end as a simple typo, I'll get an on-the-fly uh, warning that there is no such thing as base map with two P's. It's not valid. So it actually needs to be, it'll tell you what it thinks it should be, which is base map. On top of that, even if you don't want to switch to another uh, browser and find documentation and figure out what you're supposed to be doing, I also get autocomplete and suggestions and on-the-fly documentation of what base map is supposed to be. And this is pulling straight from the uh, Esri JavaScript documentation. So I think it's really powerful to save you time and uh, sort of make that learning curve a bit easier. And again, there's just a simple screenshot of how that works. Any questions? Yeah, we'll just switch. We'll switch monitors here, and we can we can back up. And you saw three. There we are. Okay. Okay. So um, you you speak much more softly than I do, so I'm just going to move it down. Um, Actually, we'll, we'll, uh, if it's okay, we'll come, we'll come back to your question at the end. Thank yeah. you. Um, so uh, building on that, so uh, just a couple of uh, things. There, there is some overhead into getting into Angular 2 plus development. Um, but it's, I found, I, I, I was an Angular 1 developer and I had put it off for quite some time. And uh, just because I was just like, oh my gosh, I have to start all over and nothing works the way I expect it to. And, and um, but now that I've taken the time, I, I see that it is totally worth the effort. Uh, there are a lot of things in Angular 2 Plus that um, have solved a lot of the old problems uh, when they went with that pure MVC uh, framework to now they have a more component-based framework, so it's much more granular. You're not spending so much time writing custom directives, which can be very challenging to do uh, because it is component-based. And um, at the same time with TypeScript, it keeps you out of trouble. So it's a great tool for team development because it keeps you out of doing name collisions. Uh, it does provide all the IntelliSense. Uh, so it, uh, and then when you combine that with the CLI and uh, this standard uh, pattern uh, that really facilitates team development to where you can walk into a code base and get right to work. You don't have to sort of learn a whole new language and a whole new way of thinking to understand the organization. So. Uh, if you're if you're just dipping your toes in the water with Angular 2 plus or 5 where we're at now and moving forward, um, it's it's a it's a really good investment. And so, building on what Andy and Jacob have done, what I wanted to do is address just a couple of common uh, design patterns and problems that you uh, uh, will encounter 
all the time in, in application development. And the first one is dealing with asynchronous operations. Um, in other frameworks and in Angular 1, there are ways of dealing with um, asynchronous operations um, that um, may not necessarily work in, um, in the newer version. So what I want to do is look at basically three patterns uh, that you can use. And the way that it is, um, that they're, it's all, what you use will be dependent upon the design environment you're in, the architecture of your application. And so I think it's a good, pa it's a good practice to be familiar with all of them. You have three tools in your box, and then you pull what the, the right tool for the job rather than trying to hammer something into shape because you don't know the other tools. So um, basically what I've done is I put together this simple uh, graph that talks about um, uh, the, the three types of, of handling asynchronous operations, promises, custom events, and RxJS observables, um, and to sort of try and map out um, how and when you might choose to use one over the other. So um, dealing with custom events, um, really uh, that works when you have a nested component. So you have a parent component working with a child component and you want to have the parent component notified by the child when something happens. So in that case, you're going to use a, use a custom, you can you choose to use a custom event. Um, promises uh, work the same way. You can use it that way, but you can also use promises when you begin to work with services. So if you're building more complex applications, chances are you're going to want to encapsulate a lot of your data model, a lot of your functionality within services. And Andy does a good job of demonstrating some of those um, in, in his later examples. And then finally, one of the things that I've just come to love is uh, using observables, RxJS observables. Um, if you were an Angular 1 developer and you used uh, broadcast, scope.broadcast as a way of sort of notifying your application when uh, things that happen in one component or one, one view and to let other parts of your application know that's no longer available to us. And the way we solve those problems was with RxJ Observables. It comes bundled right in when you, when you use the CLI to stand up your application. It's already included, so you don't need to add anything additional. It's just there and ready to use. So what I wanted to do is I, I have a, a, this simple application. Um, and what I want to do is solve it using three different Three different uh, these three different techniques and show why and how uh, you might choose one over the other. So let me just switch over to the application um, and it's basically you have um, and this is a sort of a common use pattern. Um, you've you made a select you make a selection here. Uh, you're going to pick some wonder of the world and uh, then you're going to notify your map and that sets off some sort of an asynchronous process and. Uh, in this case, what I want to do is I want to disable this, uh, this selector on the left until the operation is complete. But you can see how this applies to you know, many other use cases. And so um, what I need to do is communicate between my components. Um, you know, so the map, I, I ask the map to please, uh, and you'll see it's a very simple implementation. I've used basically everything that we've done here. And the only thing that's being called on the map is the go to function on the map view object that is created when you create a map. And so it's just going to pan the extent back and forth across the globe and, and then give us the, this tile view of, of, of the map. Um, so let's look at what the architecture here is. So we're going to deal with promises. In this case, we're not using promises against a service. We're going to use the child component is going to, is going to pan back a promise to the parent. So we have a dashboard component that is, uh, has this map component nested in it. And basically the sequence of operations are, is when I click that selector, it's gonna fire an event, as you can see here in the pseudocode, and that, 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 uh, that event handler is going to then talk to the child component, and it, it has an expose method that you request the map to pan. It hands back a promise to the dashboard component and then when the map is satisfied that it's completed everything it has to do, it's going to resolve that promise, notifying the dashboard, and then the dashboard is free to, um, uh, to re-enable the selector or whatever operations you need. So let's take a look at the code and see how we accomplish that. So here's the, um, here's the parent component. And um, we're going to see in the, um, in the uh, template you have 
Here is the Esri map component. No properties are being handed in, uh, as in like the, if you recall in the second uh, sample that Andy demonstrated, you can use uh, these directives to hand in a whole set of properties from the parent component. That's, that's a very standard design pattern, but in this case, we're not doing that. And then we build this selector based on uh, an array of data. Um, by the way, if, if you remember that horrible syntax from, from Angular 1 on how you would build a selects box, it was the most <laughs> verbose thing that it was just so redundant. You'll see that they've really worked that out. I think they, they, they may have got, they may have heard their, the, the cries of our, their user base. And uh, so now we just have this very simple NG4 where we can create their thing where we can create a, a list of options for a select element. Um, so from that dashboard component, uh, it's going to fire this event in the, in the um, parent component, the dashboard, selected wonder to let it know that a, that a, uh, a component has been selected. Um, it's going to then uh, fire uh, this method. Here's the event handler. And uh, one other thing, just let me step out for a second. Um, one of the things that um, you can do, and you'll see this actually in the map itself. So to expose, um, in this case, to expose a child component or to expose a, uh, a node within the template of that component, you need to bring in this, uh, this special library out of the Esri core package, which is view child. And you'll see uh, in the other patterns uh, where um, what, what I've done to use, what I'm using it here for is to um, uh, bring in, I bring in this Esri map component, a reference to that component object, and then I create an instance variable of it here called map. And so this is a decorator. This is, a, this is an Angular construct that you'll see all over the place. It's, it's, a type, it's created in TypeScript, but what it says is I'm going to create this variable map. It's of the type Esri map component, which is that component that's nested under it. And when you create it, take this decorator and do your magic stuff on it, which is going to essentially give me visibility into that class module. So those are all exposed, those are all essentially exposed public properties at that point, instead of being encapsulated in the uh, component itself. Here's, uh, this is just the, the data list that I'm using to build that selector. So I have this map variable. Now, if I come back down to my event handler, what you'll see is um, selected wonder. I um, do a little checking. I want to make sure I have a value. And then once I know that I have a value uh, to select, I say, OK, map. You have a method pan map, and I'm going to call that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you a set of coordinates. And with that, the, the, um, the map component is going to do what it does. Uh, the, the dashboard doesn't care. It's just going to get a promise back and it's going to wait for it to be resolved. And once it's resolved, it's going to come back and it's going to enable its panel. So what I've done up here is I've actually disabled it, calling this method. What you'll see in other instances is that I use this, like when I use up um, the events, this is actually becomes the event handler, so it becomes refactored in any event. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, I think. And now let's just take a look at the map real quick and see how that's working. So in the map component, uh, what you'll see here again is this view child is coming in here. So in this case, uh, the way uh, in which they uh, have brought, um, Esri Loader has brought the JavaScript API into the application and then instance that initial map is through a variable that's created with this view child. Here you see the decorator used again, but in this case, what it's actually doing is pointing to that element in the template where the map is going to be rendered. So that's what gives, so the, you'll see this view child library used over uh, and again, um, in any time you want to get access to sort of talk across that you're, um, talk across components or talk with, to within the template. Anyways, so moving on, um, this, is, this code is very similar to what you've already seen. It's the initial method, initialization method. Um, where, you, where it's, we've used the load, module, load modules method, which now stands in place of require. If you look at the API, you'll see require, but there's a, there's a conflict. Everybody wants to use require, so we can't use require. So uh, Webpack wants require, so we've now said, okay, you can have require, we'll just use load modules. So essentially that stands in place of, of require and uh, creates the map, creates the map view, which we've done, we've assigned it to a, um, component level variable here, so that now this class 
has a reference to that. It can use it and run, uh, you know, uh, run whatever functionality, you know, run whatever method calls uh, against that that it chooses. And in this case, it's just this very simple method. This is what the dashboard is, has access to and is calling pan map. Hands in the coordinates. Um, here it returns the promise to the dashboard component. It calls the map view method go to, which itself returns a promise. Uh, one of the things I think if, if you spend any time with ArcGIS API 4 is that now it's rich with promises. Instead of callbacks, it's promise rich. So there are uh, quite a few, uh, you'll, you'll see them all over the place and this is one case. So go to, when this resolves, um, it's gonna set that zoom. It's gonna, I put it, this is not, this is purely for demonstration, just so that it, because it happened so fast, you'd never see the deselector, the selector disabled. And so I put these little delays in just so that to, for demonstration purposes. But here it resolves the promise, which then is gonna communicate back to the uh, dashboard component and re-enable itself. So very common pattern, um, really simple um, to implement here and, and uh, it's in the repository. So what's another way? Well, um, one of the things that, uh, if you don't want to use promises within components, you have this other uh, mechanism, uh, custom events. And this is part of, uh, of the Angular uh, library itself. And um, so if we walk this pseudocode, what happens here is that you see, again, we have the same construction. By the way, events work, again, I've said this before and let me repeat it. Um, it's, it. This design pattern works when you have a parent and child component relationship. It's to allow the child to notify the parent when something has happened. Um, outside of that very sort of narrow use case, it's really, not, uh, it's really not the preferred way. If you go on Stack Overflow, you'll see people say, yeah, you can go into a class and create event emitters, don't follow that advice. It's not something that's supported or recommended, um, and in, in future versions, it can go away and it'll break your app. So if you're working out of services, you're gonna wanna use RxJ observables or promises, not the event emitter. Okay, so anyways, uh, to, just to walk through the code, what we see is, again, uh, event triggers this point selected, it fires off an event, it still has this reference to the child, but it's, the child in this case is not handing anything back. So it's just completely detached. It's like dashboard to map component, hey map, would you please pan? Map says, okay, I got this. And then doesn't, doesn't hand it back anything, it's just gonna go about, and what the dashboard will do is it, it'll just sit there, but what it does is it has an exposed event on the template that the child can call and activate it. So let's take a look at that code. So um, I want to take a quick look in the template and so you can see what's happening here. Now, if you, I, I know you probably don't recall, but um, if you go back and compare this, you'll see that in the uh, promises version, it, we just bring in this uh, app as remap directive. There's no properties that are bound to it. I, I'd mentioned that in reference to what Andy had done. In this case, what we're doing is we're uh, creating an event handler, and this is a custom event that is gonna be declared in the map component, and we call it wonder mapped. So the wonder has been mapped, and it's gonna be fired when the, uh, that met panning, uh, that go-to method is, is, uh, is resolved. And so what it does is when it fires this event, and you'll, you'll see the code in, in the map component, it's going to call to the dashboard enable panel, which is what that method they would call them before, we've just refactored it a little bit. Let's take a look in the uh, module TS to see how that looks now. So here you'll see um, this is that same event call that's coming off of the selector. Everything else is still the same. We brought in the uh, view child. We've created a reference to the map. So we have that exposed method in the map component that we can call to say, hey map, please pan. Um, and now when I click the selector, it's gonna fire the select, selected wonder, hand in uh, the uh, event object, um, and it's gonna disable the panel, and it's gonna call the map, and it's gonna hand it the coordinates, but you'll see nothing comes back. So it's just gonna wait, and all it has is this property right here, enable panel, which is what we saw in the template, is the essentially the event handler for that wonder mapped event. So what's changed in the uh, map component? 
They're pretty simple to work with. Uh, just a cup, uh, very standard pattern that you'll need to uh, familiarize yourself with. First thing that you need to do is you have to bring in these two libraries from the Angular core package, which is the output and the event emitter. So anytime you want to declare an input, you use the input uh, library. You want to declare an output or event emitter, these are the packages you use. You declare an output here and they say wonder mapped and it's a new event emitter. So this is essentially the custom event and this is that name. So when, I, when it fires, uh, this is this is what's going to be called and now in the pan map what you'll see There's no longer a, a promise. that's being resolved. It's just saying this wonder map emit the event And so anything in the parent component this if, if the parent component is configured to listen to it It'll get that message and it'll execute the code Pretty straightforward, right? Nothing too complicated here. Okay, so let's take it this uh, let's go to the next one which is now dealing with um, with observables. So what you see here is you'll notice that the um, you really have you have two sibling components that are talking to one another. I've taken the uh, the map still exists within the dashboard, but I've taken all that functionality that was in the dashboard, and now I've dropped it into another child component, which is the sibling of the map, and that's where it's going to um, need to communicate. Uh, to the map asking it to pan, but because it's no longer the parent, it can't communicate directly to the, to the map component. It has to use some intermediary, and that's where services come into play. So I just wanted to, uh, just real quickly about services. I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very broadly used term in IT, you know, um, and sometimes can be a little bit intimidating, or like, or confusing perhaps, and what, what do you actually mean by services? And in, in the Angular world, it's just really, it's really simple. What, what a service is, is just a class. It's a class instance that's being, in this case, shared amongst multiple, multiple components. So um, uh, when you use, you can really use it two ways, right? So you can use a class as a factory, right? Where um, you have a component that would, would create multiple instances of that class. In that case, it's not getting shared. It's just something that exists there in that, in that um, scope. In the, uh, in the way that we're using it, um, it's actually uh, this process, you may, may be familiar with this term, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, dependency injection, where it's this magic that Angular does where essentially it creates a single instance of the class and then it shares it against uh, with any component that wants to use that instance. So you can share basically anything. So it's a class, you can put anything you want into it. It's a, you can put your data model in there, you can put shared functionality, you can share state variables. Basically anything that you want to share across your application, this is the way to do it. And it's really easy to set up once you, once you understand the pattern. And then it's really powerful because you can begin to do some creative things with it. So in this case, what we've done is pretty simple, uh, but we create this uh, map service class and basically these two components are going to sort of bank off it to talk to one another. So the, when the selector gets selected, it says, okay, I want to pound the map, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to the service and say, hey, service, would you ask the map to pan, please? And it hands it the coordinates. And then what the, um, what the uh, map will, or the service will do is emit this, uh, it'll fire this observable. It'll notify the observer in the map and say, somebody's asked you to pan, please, please pan. And then it's going to expose a set of coordinates, which the map will then go and read, pan. And then when it's done panning, it will say, service, I don't know who cares about this, but to anybody who is listening, would you please let them know that I'm done panning? And so then the service is then going to radiate that information out. And this is where what the observables do, again, just to repeat the point I made earlier, it takes place of that scope broadcast that we used to use in Angular 1. Um, but it's actually, um, observables are so much more powerful than that. And we, and we don't really get into it here. Um, how am I doing on time? Let me just wrap this up real quick because uh, uh, I, can, I can wind out in this and, and I don't want to take up too much time. Let's go to the code. Okay. So this is the service. So let me uh, just show how this is set up. So you bring in RxJS subject here. This is, the, this is the object that's the observable. And you then create two new, uh, two new uh, observables, which one is pan request and pan complete. 
Um, and then when these methods are called, so pan to wonder is what the dashboard is gonna call. It's gonna hand it a set of coordinates which gets set to this property that this just says next. And it, the next method means radiate this to anyone who subscribed to this observable and is listening. Um, likewise, when the, when the map is done and it, uh, it's done panning, it'll call this method, which radiates back out. So um, let's just take a quick look at the code and there, and then I'll we'll move on and wrap up. I'm sorry for taking too much time. Let me, um, what do you want me to do? Should I just push forward? Okay. Um, so here we see the same, uh, and it's the same for the dashboard, so I'll just show you in this one place, and you can look at the code later. Um, basically what it do is I bring in, here is the instance of the service so that it can communicate to it. And now RxJS is in, in the um, mix, and what I do is on the init, this is where I, I, create, uh, I create this observable. So, or I, excuse me, let me go back. Here is the pan request subscription, right? So, this is, this is the observer of the observable. So this is the, this is the object that manages this subscription. The way it's created is with this kind of method here, and it looks very much like a callback. You talk to the service, you say, hey, you have an observer in there called pan request. I want a subscription to that. Hand it back to me, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you this method. So every time you call next, in my case, and it, the observable actually holds on to anybody who's, all of the call, these sort of callbacks, from anything that subscribes to it, and then it just executes them in line. In this case, it's saying, notify me uh, when, when uh, uh, I'm being asked to pan. All right, so let me uh, skip forward. And again, the code is there. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is a pretty simple uh, concept, but it's, it's uh, you see it all over the place. Anytime you have a complex application where you have routing involved, you wanna maintain uh, the state of your map. If you've done some work in there, you've set the extent, you've set some polygons, so forth, you're gonna to wanna, to, uh, when, you, when you navigate to and from it, you wanna make sure that you're able to maintain the state of your map. Um, apparently I'm down. So in this case, and I won't go in and demonstrate the code, but what you'll see is that, uh, or I won't demonstrate the app, but here you have two, these two um, tabs. You come in, you click on this, on the map, it's gonna set some points from you when you navigate away from it by clicking other route, essentially it, it, it destroys that node in the DOM. That, that component is no longer exists in the DOM. When I come back and click this map tab again, it's gonna recreate that map for me, but it's not gonna know, it's not gonna know anything about the state that I had. And so it'll just initialize the map as if it had no, nothing had ever happened. So how do, you, how do you manage that? So when I come back to it, I want it to be exactly where I left it. Well, what you can do is you can set up a service. So we've already talked about that. In this case, what I've done is that I expose a, um, a set of, um, uh, let's come in here, services. In the service, what I've done is I've set up, I have a very, I'm setting points. So, so all I wanna do is keep a collection of these points. So I expose one method, which is add a point. And here you see this TypeScript, um, uh, parameter being defined, and when it, when this is method when this method is called, it's handed a point. It pushes it onto this array, which is then exposed as a getter. In the um, in the map itself, uh, what happens? Let's uh, very quickly. Okay, so let's go down here where we initialize the map. So the, the, the map is being created. There's a map, uh, it creates the map view which hands back a promise. When that map gets resolved and I brought in the service, I say, hey, if there are any points there, and because they're already graphics, I don't have to go through a lot of work. I just call this graphics uh, pr uh, object on the map view, add many, and just hand it the array. And then the map view just rehydrates the map for me. It's really simple. Um, and you can see how you basically anything you want to save is, is an object. You just put it, push it into that class. And then the other part of this is on this on click event that I define. Anytime I click a map, I get the coordinates. I define a symbol. I uh, create a graphic out of that symbol. And then what I do is actually add it to the service first 
and then this, so the service becomes my record of truth, and then I use the service to put it on to the map state. So, um, um, and with that, I'll hand it back. All right, so last few slides. We're gonna run just a little bit long, which is okay. So just to, just to touch on another piece is there's many different ways to do stuff in Angular. And one of the purposes of services or class in another, another context that you could call it is refactoring your code out of these components. So just to give you an example, in the sample two that I showed you earlier, there's a lot of code in my component in that ng on init. And what we can do is factor this out into a service. So, whoops. So what that would, uh, oops, in the wrong place. We can factor that out into a service. And this is under sample apps, under sample number nine. And what we've done is we've pulled out that code under app, or as remap component, is I've added another file here, but what I wanted to show you is all that code has now been factored out. Oops, wrong place. All that code has been factored out into this uh, service. And just continuing on with what Sean said is we've created this service, essentially I've created a new load map method that has the center, the zoom level, and the div that we talked about before. I've wrapped this in a native promise and we're returning our load modules method. So what this does is it lets me factor out all that code in my Esri map component. And if we look down here in ng on init, all those different lines of code, I've refactored that out. One of the best practices for Angular is to keep your components as light as possible. Now I can just reference this Esri map service, call the load method that I had before, and it makes it a much more modular way to manage my code. Uh, another example of this is uh, we also have some examples related to Ionic. How many people in here are using Ionic? Ionic is essentially a mobile version of Angular. Uses a little bit different pattern for initializing the application. The repo is out on GitHub, and you can have all these links when you get a hold of the slide deck. It's Andy Gupp and Ionic to Esri Map. It's just showing yet another simple example of how to extend Esri Loader within an Angular framework that's optimized for mobile. And it, just quickly, it's just a different pattern of loading the application. We're actually using in the ng on init, we're using an async await pattern to initialize the application. Everything else is exactly the same, like all the samples we showed you, but it's a little bit different pattern for loading the API. And in this case, because of the Ionic framework, if you don't use this pattern, you don't have access to things like GPS through the navigator.geolocation pattern. Just a little bit different way to get a hold of the Esri loader and the ArcGIS API for Maps components. And so, we'll wrap it up here. Where to get help? Did you want to cover that? Sure. So, uh, yeah, these last few slides are just a uh, more reference for you. Uh, we think it's important to point out where to get help because there's a lot going on here, a lot of moving parts. Again, you've got Angular, you've got the Esri JavaScript API, and they're individually those are both complex things. So if you've got questions or concerns, you want to learn more about the Esri JavaScript API, uh, please check out these links, js.arcgis.com. should be burned into your, into your mind by now, js.arcgis.com. Uh, of course, GeoNet um, is, is great, and there's a specific place to talk about Esri JavaScript there. And of course, there's the GIS Stack Exchange. So you can bookmark all those, and they're really helpful. Now, if you want to get help with Angular, of course, it's angular.io, uh, Stack Overflow, and then uh, everyone else's favorite bookmark, which is uh, Google search to find out what you need. Uh, with, with Esri Loader, um, so there is a great readme. There's a lot of documentation there on how to use Esri Loader, and Esri Loader will become your new uh, best friend or, or frenemy or nemesis, however you want to 
however you want to deal with it, but it's going to help you be successful. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so the README is a great place to go first to read through it and understand what it, how it works and what it, uh, what it asks of you. Uh, if you do want to open a new issue, we welcome new issues, but uh, please make sure that they're actually about Esri Loader. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's easy to get, to get lost in Angular, and Esri JavaScript API, but Esri Loader serves a very specific small purpose. Um, so we just ask that you, uh, we welcome issues, but we just ask that you, uh, uh, yeah, be specific and, and have a pretty good idea that it has to do with Esri Loader as a, as a source of the issue. Yeah, on, on uh, the slide here, we've just got some uh, additional resources. Again, please visit those. Uh, grab the slides from our uh, repository for this talk. Uh, I think that more or less wraps it up. Is there anything else you guys wanted to mention? Uh, sure, we have some Esri Loader Band-Aid things you can put on your, your laptop, thanks to Tom Wason. Uh, the, a lot of the fundamentals are also in this brand new repo, github.com slash Esri Angular. CLI Esri map. A lot of the fundamentals in terms of just build the basic building blocks. And we hope, we only had an hour to try and cover A to Z. We hope we've done that some justice and really helped you guys out. And I know that we only have like a minute left. We can take one or two questions and then we'll just move out of the room and answer any other questions to let the next presenters come in.